again, YouTube. I'm back with another Redwall review. We're now getting towards the tail end of the series with the 19th of 22 books. And this is the last of the books that I had ever read previously. So when I move on to Doom White, Sable Queen, and Rogue Crew, those will all be first time reads for me. But now I introduce the book, Eulalia. Now, I remember seeing the title of this book back in the day and thinking, okay, Brian is definitely phoning it in at this point. Eulalia, for those who don't know, is the war cry shouted by badgers in the series, and it dates back, I think, to the third book in the series, Matameo, with the character of Orlando the Axe. So you see this title, and it just really screams repetition. What actually inspired me to reread the Redwall series was this old video I found uh, where it was a promotion that Brian Jakes was doing for the release of Eulalia. And Brian seemed thoroughly excited to talk, to talk about this book and its hero, Maudy Mugsbury Thropple. Now, he may very well have been putting on an act to sell his book, but it certainly was a passionate act. And it convinced me that, you know, whatever else one might critique this series for, Brian never lost his passion for being a wonderful children's author, and that passion continued into this novel and beyond. So in my earlier reviews, I talked about how some books in the Redwall series kind of felt like rewrites, you know, improvements of earlier books. That was kind of how I rationalized reading a series that could be so repetitive. I said some of the repetition was actually a matter of taking old stories and rewriting them, you know, relying on the higher and higher levels of experience Brian Jakes had as a storyteller. So Marielle of Redwall, for example, felt like a richer version of the original novel, Redwall, to me. Its sequel, The Bellmaker, was kind of a revisiting of the sequel to Redwall, Madame Mayo. Martin the Warrior was a revamped origin story, a sort of a, a richer tale in, in terms of character development than Mossflower had been. And finally, Outcast of Redwall is more loosely, but kind of a, a rewrite of Salamander Strong. So as the series progressed, I kind of gave up on the idea of interpreting individual books as rewrites of earlier books. And I don't know if it's because the books actually became less thematic, or it's just that eventually there was so much repetition in the series, it was hard to truly parse one book from another. That said, the idea of discussing this book as a rewrite of an earlier book did occur to me when I was thinking about Eulalia. Maybe not in a deep thematic way, but in terms of its structure, it did remind me of Marl Fox. So what did I say back when I did my Marl Fox review? I said overall, Marl Fox made for a quality re reading experience. Compared to its predecessor, The Long Patrol, which had a ton of characters and felt a bit more focused on military tactics than some of the other books in the series, Marl Fox felt quite digestible. You know, there was a manageable amount of main characters to keep track of, and the prop plot points felt appropriately paced. You know, it was a story actually about storytelling and character development, not necessarily the specifics of battles. Now, on the other hand, both Marl Fox uh, and Eulalia, and certainly Eulalia more than Marl Fox, they feel kind of like generic Redwall books. But... If you like Redwall books, that's not necessarily a bad thing. You know, these are fine samples of what you look for in the series. Maybe getting a bit more negative, both of these books felt a bit more lower stakes than some of the other books in the series. Like, I'm not saying a character you love has to die, but I feel like that's what gives some of the other books uh, their weightier feel, kind of reinforces some of the themes. This is a book where basically everything just turns out entirely okay for the main characters without any complications. So Eulalia, unsurprisingly, is the story of a badger. That badger is named Gorath, and he starts the story living on a farm with his grandparents, and he has this pitchfork that he used for his farming, but also potentially serves as a weapon. And this pitchfork has a name. It's called Tung, T-U-N-G. Anyway, this farm is raided by pirates, and Gorath's grandparents are killed, and he's captured by the pirate captain Vizca Longtooth. So Vizca has this ambition to keep Gorath prisoner, hoping that eventually Gorath's spirit will be broken and he'll basically be able to turn him into some kind of Hulk-type secret weapon because 
badgers are badgers are exponentially stronger than most of the other animals in the red ball universe. Now, the idea of taking a good character, breaking their spirits, and trying to turn them into a secret weapon could, of course, be a very unique idea for a red ball universe, but actually going through with that would have been way too risky a move. So basically what happens is Gorath escapes about a third of the way through the book, and everything with him becomes kind of more conventional from there on out. The book has two other protagonists. As I mentioned earlier, one of them is a hare named Mad Maudy Mugsbury Throttle. So at first, Maudy is kind of written like Dottie from Lord Brocktree, i.e. she's this annoying outcast amongst the hares who has a skill set, uh, but is also seen as a kind of goofball, little clumsy. She really has to prove herself. Now, unfortunately, once her journey starts, she instantly just becomes fully competent. Like, yeah, she'll have the odd funny line here or there. But yeah, for the most part, her competence is never in question. So she's an entertaining character to read about, particularly considering her fighting is all boxing. So she's going into these fights with people with swords and maces, and she's just, you know, a wonder with her fists. You know, if this book had visuals, that would be great. But of course, it's largely not illustrated, though the illustrations that are in here I do think are really cool, some of my favorite in the series. But yeah, basically, Maudie is just this character without any sort of character arc whatsoever, and she's kind of fun, but of course we've seen a million hares by this point, as we've seen a million of virtually every animal in the Red Ball series. Finally, the third protagonist is an actual resident of Red Ball Abbey. He's a hedgehog named Orkwill Prank, and his journey starts actually as he gets banished from Redwall after he is exposed as basically a kleptomaniac. So Orkwell's introduction uh, feels like an unfortunately really corny, confused retelling of the outcast of Redwall. So in that earlier novel, a young Redwaller was also banished due to his history of theft. The key difference, however, was the thief from Outcast of Redwall, you know, had broader social problems and had even attempted a murder while also being sympathetic because clearly at least some of his antisocial behavior was shaped by the fact that the other red wallers were bigoted against him as a ferret. But in Orkwell's case, it just feels really weird or fake or something that he's treated so harshly because basically he's just stealing or borrowing little household objects kind of as a game and then he eventually gives them back. I mean, I could see how that would be annoying, but that doesn't really add up to the kind of thing that you punish way by, you know, banning someone from their house for a year. Another thing with Orkwell's predicament is that it shows the ambiguity of how the Red Ball universe is constructed. And this has always been an interesting quirk, flaw, however you want to define it with the series. Like, it's unclear, are we dealing with animals that are actually the size of animals? Or are they more like human furries? You know, what's, what's going on with that? But in this instance, it feels like the uncertainty in the universe actually matters and negatively affects the reading experience. So on the one hand, throwing a character who, and it's ambiguous, you know, kind of SpongeBob SquarePants style, whether Orkwell is a child or an adult or something in between, but throwing such a character out of their society and into the woods for a year are we supposed to interpret this as a horribly cruel or at least harsh punishment? You know, something that could expose him to death if he's not able to put enough food together or he gets attacked by predators? Or are we supposed to see this as a totally innocuous minor punishment because outside of a few buildings like Redwall and Salamandastron, most of the creatures in this universe do just seem to live in little burrows in the woods. So maybe Orkwell is completely fine. I mean, unfortunately, the book just feels ambiguous about that, and the ambiguity is not helped by the fact that the universe's structure kind of allows for it. And again, I'm not against ambiguity. I don't need all universes to be fully logically consistent, but here it just feels confusing in terms of it's an emotional weight. Is this just the equivalent of work will getting a detention, or is it actually the equivalent of someone getting banished, kicked out of their community? Anyway, the story moves along, and eventually the quests of Gorath the Badger, Maudie the Hare, and Orkwill the Hedgehog are entwined. They also get joined at one point by a squirrel named Rangball, who can be a bit of a troll, and I kind of wish we got to see a bit more from him, because his funny moments 
though few, were they were pretty fun. As for other characters, we have the main villain, Vizca, who is fine but not particularly unique. Midway through the book, we also get a cartoonish secondary villain, a brown, a brown rat named Grunt and Curdly. He has a bunch of Looney Tunes-esque scenes at first, so I was con convinced he's the kind of character who, you know, shows up in one chapter of the book, is defeated, and then goes away, you know, kind of like the way lizards would be used in the story. But in fact, he becomes the second major villain of the book, uh, and he somehow ends up in a war with Redwall and has all these comedic scenes where he's like, oh, I just want to eat as many eggs as possible. So I think he's a great character, but spoiler alert, he just kind of dies at this completely random moment in a way that sort of shows no interest in the sort of broader fabric of the story. Like, yes, you could say the way he dies completes his personal arc, but it just feels like such a non sequitur. This character comes in and exits without much effect on the greater world. There's one other villain in the story who is a character simply called a water bowl. It's not often in this series that a character doesn't get a name. I mean, Brian names so many of his minor villains, and I keep thinking, you know, don't waste names on these characters, Brian. Save them for later. You're going to run out eventually. But for whatever reason, this unfortunate bowl doesn't end up getting named. And this is a character who, kind of like Grunt and Curdly, when he first shows up, you think, okay, this is going to be a character who shows up in one scene and we never see again. Uh, and maybe that's the reason he doesn't get a name. You're supposed to view him as innocuous, and then he keeps surprising you by coming back. So I guess I like that element of the book as well. But again, it felt like Brian missed some nuance and a chance to do something distinct, because when the bowl turns out to be evil uh, towards the end of his story, it felt, well, he was more interesting when he was just incredibly unpleasant, but didn't fit into the hero villain binary. It was just kind of his own category of thing. And Brian's like, nah, in order for this story to resolve, I just need him to be straight up evil. Finally, uh, the Juosum Shrews play a fairly prominent role in this book. Uh, and that's the other reason I see this one is similar to Marl Fox, the book that gave the most prominent story to Shrews. So, the shrews in the story, like in Moral Fox, are not just space fillers. They actually have a bit of a plot of their own. So this young shrew named Osbill uh, is basically forced midway through the book to rapidly take a leadership position with the shrews. And through this, we are reminded of the sort of morally gray character of even the benevolent shrews that we really haven't seen since the first book. Red Wall, in which the shrews were uncertain for a long time if they wanted to help Matthias. So Osbill has some sort of interesting motives on his pursuit of revenge, and he makes for an interesting character, even if he's slightly too much on the periphery for me to overall say, okay, he makes this book above average. No, he just doesn't have enough influence for that. So does this book end up having defining themes? Uh, well, what we do get is somewhat late, late in the story, Gorath talks about his struggles with the blood wrath. And I realize it makes it onto the cover of this book where you see him with these red eyes. So blood wrath is this vicious state that badgers go into when they encounter their mortal enemies. And throughout the series, Brian Jakes has tried to portray blood wrath as a kind of tragic condition that means the badgers become powerful fighters, but they're out of control. They're pure killing machines. And there's always kind of this subtext that a badger and blood wrath could hurt innocent creatures as well, could do things that are viewed as morally wrong, even within the Red Bull universe. But Brian never takes the risk of actually having a badger do something morally wrong. So while this book is a bit unique in the way that Gorath directly contemplates the issue of blood wrath, and he even has an interesting backstory for when he first experienced it, it's not like it goes to any particularly risky places with this subject. It's not like Gorath is any darker than any of the previous Badgers. And in fact, the way he deals with Blood Wrath, it doesn't feel like it means anything. Like he's still just as violent. It's just his eyes don't turn red, basically. So they kind of try and squeeze in this unique theme at the end, but it's just not given the weight in practice that it would need to actually feel unique. So that was essentially my impression of this book. Uh, let me know if you have any other thoughts on Eulalia. Again, obviously a late addition to the Red Wall series, so hard to impress someone who knew the books from well before it 
came out, but if you have any distinct thoughts on this one that's special to you, uh, let me know. And otherwise, I will eventually be back with a review of Doom White. Mm -hmm.